Welcome to our broadcast today. I'm Ken Baer, a pastor at Faith Dialogue, a non-denominational ministry here in Celebration, Florida. We work cooperatively with all of the area churches in Celebration, including Celebration Community Church, Corpus Christi Catholic Church, the Community Presbyterian Church, Illuminate Church, Celebration Anglican Fellowship, and Celebration Seventh-day Adventists. Our call to worship today is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, where it says in verse 14, Since then we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Our worship today is from our own worship minister, D. Bellavati. Thy saints have dwelt secure. 
Sufficient is thy arm alone, and our defense is sure. Before the hills in others turn, on earth receive her frame. From everlasting thou art God, to endless ears the same. The man of flesh to dust return, ye sons of men. All nations rose from earth at first and turned to earth again. A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone. Short as the watch that ends the night Before the rising sun Time like an ever-rolling stream Bears all its suns away They fly forgotten as a dream Dies at the opening day Best, our hope for years to come. Our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Welcome back. We're in a sermon series called Unstoppable. Uh, based on the New Testament book of the Acts of the Apostles. Um, as we begin our message today on the story of Peter and Cornelius in chapter 10, the chapter, the 10th uh, chapter in the book of Acts, I want to go back to the words of Jesus that we found in the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, the last three verses, because this is going to be key to our understanding today of this account of Peter and Cornelius. Matthew 28, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know, it's very clear if you read all of the gospel accounts, that Jesus was different. He was uniquely different. He, he crossed cultural lines. He associated with sinners, prostitutes, tax collectors, the poor, the unloved. Uh, he not only got close to lepers, those who had skin diseases and were unclean, um, but he reached out and touched them as well. He healed them of their diseases. You know, he, Jesus ended up going through Samaria and actually sat and talked with a Samaritan woman. We read that gospel, that account in Gospel of John. You know, there were lots of reasons for Jesus to not speak to her. However, living in the 21st century here in, in America, it, it's, it's very difficult with our modern cosmopolitan way of thinking. We, we actually become clueless. Uh, we don't understand the cultural divide that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans, between men and women. Uh, it was not just socially unacceptable to cross that divide, it was actually prohibited by law. And, and it wasn't just the Jews and the Samaritans. It was the Jews and the Greeks, the Romans, and, and the Gentiles. If you remember the story of Jesus and Pilate, the religious leaders that were accusing Jesus would not go into Pilate's headquarters, what was called the Hall of Judgment, because they would be defiled if they entered this Gentile building. Jesus had to go in by himself. And then afterwards, Pilate had to come out to the porch to address the religious leaders because they would not come into the building. And it, and it wasn't just the Jews and, and the Romans. If you remember the story of Joseph, who was sold by his brothers into slavery, 
and ended up in, in Egypt and was a high official, number two only to the, to the Pharaoh. Uh, when his brothers came to uh, meet with him, when they came to Egypt in uh, chapter 43 of, of Genesis, it says that Joseph ate alone. Joseph ate alone. And then it says the Egyptian servants uh, would not eat with the Jews. The servants would not eat with the Jews because they would not eat with the Hebrews. Uh, that was what the Jews were called at that time because it was abhorrent to them. So this cultural divide has existed through for millennia. Uh, and it's in this context of this ancient world that Jesus is born, that Jesus crossed these cultural line. And then in, uh, in the Great Commission, he says, now you go. You go to the nations. Go and make disciples of all this na of the nations. Now, the word nations in the Greek is, is the word ethnos. Um, it's the same word that we get our word ethnicities from. Go to these ethnicity, ethnicities and make disciples of them. So why did Jesus say this? Why was it so important to cross these, these, um, these uh, ethnic lines? Well, because Jesus came to die for the sin of the world. Jesus was redeeming the entire world, not just the Jewish nation. This was the new covenant that Jesus had spoken of. This was the promise that God made to Abraham, that through the loins of Abraham, the whole world would be blessed. So as we begin today in Acts chapter 10, this 10th chapter, uh, realize that so up through the first nine chapters, there's only been one Gentile, one Gentile that's been saved. And that was the Ethiopian servant, the Ethiopian eunuch, the servant of the Queen Candace. And remember that uh, it was Philip that was directed by the Spirit of God to go catch up to the chariot. It was God moving Philip to talk with the Ethiopian. Now, the church is growing in the book of Acts. That's why we call this series Unstoppable. But it's growing strictly among the Jews, likely tens of thousands of them, and it's expanding in Jerusalem and Judea and into Samaria, but it's still only among the Jews. And when was this? Well, scholars generally agree that the timeline that this event in Acts 10 and 11 um, that we'll be reading about today with Cornelius and Peter is likely about seven years after Pentecost, seven years after the Holy Spirit descended on the 120 in the upper room. It's three years after Saul is converted because he had already spent three years in the desert with Jesus and then had returned to Damascus in the previous chapter. And now it's been seven years, seven years, and God is going to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. He's going to open that, that door up. Now this is going to require a, a breakdown of ethnic and racial barriers, and God is going to do this supernaturally. First, there are, there are two things that we need to point out to you, and the first one is, is likely pretty obvious. Uh, you and I and most of the people that are watching this broadcast today are, are Gentiles. We were not born into a, a Jewish family. We're not included in what God continues to refer to as His, His chosen people. The Bible says that we've been, we've been grafted in. We're either, we are the recipients of God's grace. We are the ones that God is interested in, in reaching and bringing His salvation, His grace, His, His mercy in the application of the shed blood of, of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Secondly, just as we saw in the case of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, this is completely God's doing. God is the one that's going to visit a man named Cornelius, a centurion, a Gentile, and tell him that his prayers are, are answered. It's God is going to speak then to, to Peter through a vision, a vision that he tells Peter three times. So let me summarize this, this story for you in the 10th chapter of the, of the book of Acts. And then we'll come back and look at some specific verses and we'll unpack it and, and see what it can teach us today. So we're in the 10th chapter of Acts, and chapter, chapter 10 of Acts, of course, follows chapter 9, and that's where we get the context. And if you remember in, in chapter 9, Paul is beginning to, to preach Jesus, and then we also see the miraculous healing of Dorcas, also called Tabitha, uh, by Peter. And, and Peter ends up staying with Simon, uh, a tanner, in Joppa. So chapter 10 begins with the story of Cornelius. 
And we're told that Tordinius is a centurion that's living in Caesarea and that he was a, a good man. The scriptures say that he was God-fearing, and we'll get back to that in, in just a few minutes, what the whole idea of God-fearing actually means. And that Cornelius and his family prayed to God regularly. And then one day, an angel came to him and said, Cornelius, your prayers have been answered. And then the angel tells him to specifically send men to Joppa to find a man named si Peter, um, who is staying with a man called Simon, who's a tanner, and, and gives him very specific directions exactly where he is. And this is what the angel says. He says, bring back Peter and hear what Peter has to say. Pretty specific instructions, don't you think? And these instructions are, are direct from heaven via an angel. Meanwhile, Peter is in, in Joppa. He's staying with Simon the tanner and he's hungry. And the, while the food was being prepared, uh, the scriptures tell us that Peter fell into a trance and he had a, a vision of a large sheet held up by four corners that was being led down from heaven. And on the sheet there was all kinds of uh, detestable animals, animals that were unclean, uh, what we, we would refer today as, as unkosher. And the voice tells him, get up Peter, kill and eat. And these were all unclean animals. Uh, so Peter replies, Surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And now this vision happens, uh, the scriptures tell us, three times. And while Peter is still pondering what this vision means, there's a knock at the door. And it's Cornelius' men, the three men that Cornelius had sent to go find, go find Peter. So Peter invites them in. They tell him the story about their master Cornelius and how an angel had told him specifically to go get Peter and that they were to bring him back to Cornelius. And this is an amazing account, just a tremendous, a tremendous account. So let's, let's pause here just for a moment. As we said at the beginning, the Lord had given the church a command, a commandment called the Great Commission to go and take the gospel uh, to all nations, to all ethnic groups, uh, the different people groups. Jesus had clearly shown through his ministry that he was called to the people of Judah, but he was very capable and comfortable in, in crossing over uh, and, and dealing with what we call the untouchables, the lepers, the tax collectors, the harlots, and even the Samaritans. When uh, Jesus was pressed about who a neighbor was, he gave the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, you remember that parable. It's an obvious and shocking deference uh, to the Samaritans, to the humiliation of the Jewish people that were listening to the parable. However, would we say, based on all this information, that God was displeased with how the apostles were growing the church, with the inability of the apostles to, uh, to, to, to bless the church and to be able to, to make it grow? Uh, not at all. Not at all. Um, Jesus was, as, as the, book of, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes says, as Solomon says, there's a time for every season under the sun. And this will be a season. And let me read to you uh, what uh, verse uh, 14 uh, says in, in the book of Romans. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one on whom they've not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Now, the reason I read that to you is because what Cornelius needed, what Cornelius needed was a preacher. Uh, now, I realize I, I say that with all great humility because that's what I do, but actually that's what Cornelius needed. Cornelius was a, a good man. He was, he was a God-fearer. Now, God-fearer uh, was a word that was used in the Bible to describe Gentiles who did not believe, uh, like many, believe, uh, like many uh, Gentiles, in many gods. They were not pagans. Uh, they believed in, in one God. They believed in one God, and they, were, they, were, uh, they had great respect for the, the God of Israel, the great affection for the Jewish people. However, they had not converted completely over to Judaism. Uh, while some did con convert, uh, there was one big reason why most did not convert, and that is because one of the rites of initiation to become a Jew 
was circumcision. And circumcision for the males was just too painful for them to consider as an adult. However, it is for this reason that there will be a great opportunity for these God-fearers to become disciples of Jesus. Because soon we'll see that the G Gentiles are not going to be required to become Jews. They're not going to be required to be circumcised in order to become followers of Jesus Christ. As the early church grew all through the Roman Empire, it was the Jews and the God-fearers that quickly embraced Christianity. They embraced the faith of the apostles and they became disciples of Jesus Christ. But we aren't there yet. Cornelius hasn't heard his, his first sermon. So let's get back to the scripture for today. Cornelius had a vision and the angel uh, told, uh, told him to go get Peter. And Peter also had this vision of the sheet and then the angel, then there was a, a knock at the door. And we'll pick up the story in verse 17. Now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodged there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he who you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited him in and lodged there. You know, this is a very interesting and actually a very unique exchange between two groups of people that are referenced in the Bible. Uh, these two groups, Peter and Cornelius, don't know each other. They don't know anybody that knows each other. Uh, but God orchestrates this. Now, this is not without precedent. If you remember the story of Saul and Ananias, both Saul and Ananias were directly, personally um, uh, sent to each other by the Lord. Saul was told to wait for Ananias, and Ananias was told to go and minister to Saul. If we go through this chapter 10 and chapter 11 of the books of Acts, it's likely going to challenge your theology. And let me tell you, that's actually pretty good. One of the commentaries I read said that often the events in these two chapters specifically won't fit into your theology depending on your denomination. Uh, but let me tell you, friends, don't try to make the theology of your denomination fit the Bible. It's actually the opposite. Your theology comes from the Bible. The Bible is the source of all our theology, and often it will challenge you. Uh, but that's okay. You see, the Bible says that just as the heavens are higher than the earth, His ways are higher than our ways, and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. You know, when I was in, in seminary, I, I took a, the required class in systematic theology. Big name, isn't it? Uh, it was actually a pretty comprehensive class and a class that a lot of the students feared because it was, it was relatively difficult. Uh, the first day of class, our professor stood before the class and this is what he said. Now, I'm going to try to... He was, he was from Georgia and he spoke rather slowly, had this thick accent. I can't do the accent but let me see if I can imitate uh, my professor of the systematic theology class. First day of class, he said, we are endeavoring to undertake the study of what is called systematic theology. Theology is the study of God and all of his attributes. Systematic refers to an orderly, orderly, methodical, and structured approach to this endeavor we will discover that even if we are successful, we will have to admit that we fall short. We will fail to fully understand, for God is not finite in that we can define His parameters. He is the creator of all things, and while He is unchanging and totally consistent, He is beyond our full understanding. And then my professor continued. He says, 
We will profit from this study as we learn much of what the Bible has to say about God and the relationship that he desires to have with men. You know, in other words, our, my professor was saying to me, and this is what I heard, is that like we were like fish in a glass bottle trying to figure out who it was that, that changed the water. Now Peter, the Apostle Peter, had a, a very solid theology. He was well versed in the Old Testament. We find that on the day of Pentecost because he quotes large portions of the Old Testament uh, from memory. He believed that the Jewish faith was handed down by Moses uh, to the people of Israel. The Jewish people were God's people. They had been promised the Messiah and he had come. He had come and was born in Bethlehem. Peter believed that Jesus was worthy of worship as he was the only Son of God. Jesus had told them that if they had seen him, they had seen the Father. God's people were the Jews and Peter believed at this time that it was through circumcision, through observing the Sabbath and learning the Torah, that God's people would come to fully embrace Jesus as the Messiah. So let's see what Peter has to say. We'll pick up the story in verse 24. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then Peter said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore I came without objection and soon as I was sent for. I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? Verse 30. So Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been answered, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent him to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Now, there is much we can learn from this passage. Note that God had prepared Peter and told him that some men were coming for him and God had prepared Peter through the vision of the sheet and all of the unclean animals. You know, back in verse 17, the scripture says that while Peter was still thinking and wondering what this vision of the sheet and the unclean animals meant, the delegation from Cornelius had arrived. Now, Peter was unsure at that time what it meant. That's what the scripture says. And it's interesting to note that many today will read this passage and say, oh, that's exactly where the scriptures tell us that the kosher laws are done away with. Uh, but that's not what the scripture says. Peter doesn't say that either. In fact, in this passage we just read, Peter says, but God has shown me that I should not call any man uncommon or unclean. Peter's vision on the sheets and the unclean animals was about the Gentiles. It wasn't at all about food. You know, and I love Peter's humility. He tells Cornelius to get up and that he, Peter, was, was just a man like he was. And then he asks him a, a simple question. I ask them, for what reason have you sent for me? I would love to be more like Peter. You know, Peter was actually a, a pretty simple man, a fisherman. And after he had been filled with the Holy Spirit, he was really quite teachable. The Lord is teaching him. And Peter is humble enough to just follow the Lord's leading. Remember, Peter sees the vision of the sheet and the unclean animals three times and ponders what it's mean. But he's willing to follow the Lord even though he doesn't fully understand. Cornelius sends three men to collect him and he goes. Then in, in verse 25, Peter just walks right into the house 
with Cornelius and all of these Gentiles. Now, normally Peter would not have gone into the house of a, of a Gentile, but his heart is receptive. Peter is, is learning. He follows God's lead even when he doesn't understand. That's why he asked the questions. Why are you here? And why did you send me? If Peter wasn't totally clear on the big picture of what was happening in this account, why should we feel that it's going to fit into our simple theology? God is orchestrating. He's orchestrating every detail on both sides to bring Peter and Cornelius together. Yet Peter had no clue why he was going to Caesarea and Cornelius didn't know why what Peter was was going to say. What God requires from any of us is simple obedience. God rewards simple obedience, not perfect theology. And don't worry about the big picture. God will still lead you. So remember I said earlier that Cornelius was a, a good man. He was a God-fearer, but he was lacking something. He needed to hear the sermon. Uh, that's actually what it says, literally. Cornelius tells Peter why he calls. He says, now therefore we are present before God to hear all things commanded you by God. Cornelius wants to, to hear. He has ears to hear and Peter's going to preach a sermon. Verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with, with him, and we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Pretty good sermon, don't you think? Peter covered the basics of the gospel in less than three, four minutes. You know, it's, it's really a, a simple message. And all too often, we, we make it so complicated, so complicated that ultimately our theology becomes flawed. We try to make the divine and the sovereign work of God, the grace and mercy of God, fit our theology. We try to put God in a box, but God is not willing to be put in a box. Look what happens next. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Okay, remember I, I told you that often these chapters and in Acts uh, 10 and 11 will we'll mess with your theology. Uh, that's okay. Sometimes your theology needs to be messed with. What happens in this passage? Well, before Peter was able to conclude the sermon, before Cornelius or any of these Gentiles that were assembled there listening to Peter had a chance to, to raise their hand, had a chance to repent of their sin, ask God for forgiveness, or say the sinner's prayer, the Holy Spirit descends on them. And Peter and the rest of the Jewish believers are astonished. Peter, however, recognizes that it's the Holy Spirit. And he recognizes that immediately. So he says, then Peter answered, verse 47, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? 
and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord and they asked him to stay a few days. So, so let's wrap up this, this lesson today. There's so much going on here in chapter 10. I, I would highly recommend that when you get a chance, get your Bible out or whatever you use to read your Bible, your computer device or your iPhone or, or Apple Pot, whatever, whatever it is, and read the scriptures. Let these scriptures sink in. Peter commanded these Gentiles to be baptized in the name of the Lord. This showed that Peter had full acceptance of these Gentile believers into the community, uh, the body of Christ. Their baptism, like ours, is an outward sign of what God has already done on the inside. You know, a, a few years ago, I had the great opportunity to oversee uh, the discipleship ministry of a relatively large church. And, and uh, baptism was part of the discipleship ministry and how we administered baptism. And baptism in this church at the time was typically administered and encouraged when a person was becoming a, a member of the church at the end of the membership classes. I know this is often how churches do it, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. Baptism is, 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 a, is a very significant, it's one of the two sacraments that Jesus gives to us. Uh, baptism also often is administered uh, when somebody uh, belongs, when they become a member of the church. And historically, it was done that way as well. The, the issue I had was that if I go through all of the scriptures, all of the New Testament, uh, in all cases, baptisms were not connected to, to membership. In the scriptures, baptism typically was immediate. And the very next step as a step of obedience when somebody came to faith in Christ. So we sat together, all of the pastors and me being the new guy, and we talked about baptism, and it took us a while. But ultimately we agreed in two things. Number one, that baptism would certainly be encouraged. It would be offered and even required when somebody was being, uh, being brought in as a member of the church if they had not been baptized prior. Uh, but we also would make public baptisms much more often and we would celebrate when people came to faith and ask them if they would like to be baptized immediately following when they came to faith. So let's go back to the scriptures for today. The Gentiles being accepted into the body of Christ was not something new uh, in, the, in the Bible with this event with Cornelius. It actually been promised long before. Uh, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah saw the days. He saw the days when the light of the gospel would shine on the Gentile world. This is what it says in Isaiah chapter 60. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. All nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Remember that God had promised Abraham all the way back in the beginning, uh, in the book of Genesis, that out of Abraham's loins, all of the nations of the earth would be blessed. Jesus also promised in John 10, 16, he says, if I'm lifted up uh, from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. That's in John chapter 12, verse 32. In closing, let me, let me tell you a story. One of the, one of the things I, I get to do in my ministry, and it's, it's, it's very humbling and it's also a, quite a privilege, is I have the opportunity to often be with a, a member of our congregation or a member of their family during the final days. Sometimes it's in a hospital, sometimes it's in their home or hospice, it's at bedside. Now, if I'm given the opportunity, I'll always pray with them and share Jesus with them. Often, when I do this, they're not able to, to fully respond. They realize their life is coming to an end and they need the, to confront. They need to confront what they actually believe about, about heaven and earth, what they, who they think Jesus is and, and what it is that their, their religion tells them 
about life after death. Now, even without getting a response from them, I'll pray with them. I'll pray that they accept the love and the forgiveness that is available through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, now someone may, some may be skeptical, and, and some may say, Pastor Ken, can a person really be saved at life end, at the very last minute? And don't they have to confess their sins and repent of the things that they have done? But here's my thought. No one really knows what happens in the heart of a man or a woman except God. God knows our hearts and we're blessed beyond measure because we have a God who is, is full of mercy. He's, he's slow to anger and he's always willing to bring us to redemption. John 3.16 says, For whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. My friends, don't let your theology put you in a box. Um, what, what seems impossible to man is often possible with God. If you're unsure of where you stand with God, if you're unsure if you've ever responded to a sermon like Cornelius and his family and friends, if you've never responded, uh, let me tell you that there's that possibility for you today. God loves you. And he lo loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to, to die for you, to die in your place. Jesus lived a, a perfect life, something that we couldn't possibly do. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he opened the gates of heaven to everyone, everyone who believes in him. Now, this belief in Jesus Christ, in his death and his resurrection, is not a, a casual belief. Uh, like believing in gravity or that George Washington was the first president of the United States. Not at all. This belief is, is intimate. It's, it's ch life changing. In fact, the Bible calls it transformational. God will call you his child and you can call God your father. But it begins and ends with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Take a step. Open your heart to Jesus. See where he leads you. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short. And the Bible says that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you have questions, just, just message me. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we hope you'll tune in the next few weeks as we continue our study and the Acts of the Apostles. We have two services every week, one on Sunday and one on Wednesday, and both are broadcast at 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. Beginning this Wednesday, this Wednesday we'll be looking at prophecy in the Bible in a new series on Wednesdays called Pondering Prophecy. You see, over 25% of the Bible is, is prophecy, so we'll never run out of material. And I'm going, to take, I'm going to take steps to make sure that we include some of the recent events that we see all around us, from the founding of Israel in 1948 to the COVID-19 virus and the pandemic. And we'll bring that in and see in light of the scriptures what that, what that speaks to us today. Our website is www.faithdialogue.org, and you'll find information about our ministry, all of our video teachings, and our audio podcasts. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for the opportunity today to be able to share the gospel online. And we give you all the praise and the glory, Lord, for what you're teaching us in this 10th chapter of Acts about Cornelius and Peter. We thank you, Lord, that it was you that was at work to bring the light to the Gentiles. And we give you all the praise for that in Jesus' name.